I'm trying to think of the song. Oh, yeah, it's uh, My Little Buttercup has the sweetest smile. You can't sing with me because you don't know. You've never seen this movie. Shit. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't know there was so much riding on me singing <laughs> along with you. Welcome to your inner childhood movie, the podcast where we look back on things from our childhood and see if they're any good. Beginning with my name is DJ. And my name is Damon. I don't know we why are... I forgot how to do that. Los Dos Amigos, as we're often called. Mm. Today we're talking about Three Amigos, which mm, twist. I just realized is funny because they say three, but then they say Amigos. <laughs> you have somehow never seen this movie, and that I find that shocking. I think once, for some reason, this is a plot I have seen. I feel like it was parodied on multiple cartoons I watched as a kid. Mm. I feel like Tiny Toons had a Three Amigos style episode, or maybe Animaniacs as well. I do know generally the plot. It's basically Galaxy Quest in the West rather than space. Yes, yes. It's almost exactly that. Didn't we watch something else that was in this vein? I feel like I've made this comparison saying, this movie is like Galaxy Quest or Three Amigos, and now I can't remember what it was. Yeah, I don't remember. I'm glad I brought it up then. I'm surprised this is... That you haven't seen this too, because I feel like this is just a feeling I have, knowing your sense mm-hmm. of humor, that it's going to align with your vibe. You've got the Martin Short of it all, the Steve Martin of it all, less so the Chevy Chase of it all, but he's there. Thank you. Thank you. Of, <laughs> of the three, I would rather be paired with the first two than the <laughs> the terrible person of the three. I just mean uh, humor, you know. You know, when I was a kid, I did not care for Martin Short. I don't know yeah. what it was about him, but I did not care for him. Same. And as I've gotten older, I appreciate him more and find myself in a YouTube vortex watching Jiminy Glick compilations. Yeah, and, I really uh, hated Jiminy the Glick hell out of when it. it when it was a thing. Oh the yeah. First, like, and that's not even that's like a young adult or late teen when that came out because like the late nineties yeah. or something when he was doing that. And I was like, I don't get this. And now when I watch it, I'm like, this is hilarious. <laughs> But, you know, I guess all the, like, fat phobia stuff is not that funny. But, like, the way he interviews and basically just slams in. Uh, it's very Zach Galifianakis between two firms vibe where he's just, like, basically making fun of the celebrity yeah, to their face. that is a good comparison. I, I like that vibe a lot. And I also just like the idea of a person who has the cachet of an expert who knows nothing. He yeah. never seems to know the movies they've done. He's not watched the projects they're on. He forgets their names often. It's just a good joke, except for the fat phobia stuff, which is, I would say, a fifth of the jokes are fat phobic yeah. jokes, which sounds like a lot now that I've said it, but I feel like the the vast majority are about him being incompetent and a uh, moron and making fun of the celebrities to their face. When some of it's just like, it's more ridiculous, like, he'll just like shove a handful of candy into his face at once. It's like- Right. Or like eat a whole donut yeah. in one bite. Yeah. But also on Only Murders in the Building, which they're doing now, The uh, every time Martin Short does the- <clears throat> Like when he's scared or something, he does this little snort and it <laughs> it gets me every time. He uses it a lot, but it still <laughs> gets me. It's a very good bit. I remember thinking this movie was- like the pinnacle of my dad's humor. I don't know if he actually mm-hmm. likes this movie that much, but it reminds me a lot of my dad. I remember like watching this with my dad and him like being like, oh, those guys are pretty funny. Like that vibe. Those three those amigos, b- they're all right. I like that gray haired one. <laughs> <laughs> Why wouldn't he know Steve Martin's name? Like Steve Martin's an <laughs> he knows who Steve thing. Why wouldn't he know Steve Martin's <laughs> name? <laughs> I like the gray haired fella. I tell you, I've been hearkening to his personality. You know, he used to do a whole comedy bit with an arrow through his head. I'm also imagining, by the way, your father is in a rocking chair in front of an Old West general store. That's Just how I'm, That's the set I've put him on. Always Whitlin. <laughs> He's Whitlin. Whitlin. There's some good bits in this. I remember my favorite part, I think, is Steve Martin's big speech at the end. Because the the bad guy's name is El Guapo, and they he's talking about we all have our own El Guapo, and ours just happens to be a very evil man named El Guapo, and they're all just like very confused. 
it's pretty great. I remembered what the other movie is. A Bug's Life is Three oh, Amigos. Yes. yes. Yeah. Why is this a trope that Hollywood just keeps going back to? Actors getting stuck in the same situations they act in and not being able to get out of it. Yeah, and it, it, there's it's always funny. Some... But those other two movies are very funny, and I imagine, uh, according to you, this movie will be funny to me. Well, I hope it holds up. But there, there's also like this always a guilt factor that the actors are made to feel like they've wronged the other people. When it's like you're all fucking idiots <laughs> at this point, right? They like made the a, alien species. Well, a really okay, you stupid get a, mistake. Yeah, you get a past alien species, but like you know, at first they weren't pretending to be anything. You just have never encountered. Let's say you're not idiots so much as very sequestered. Like you don't actually know a lot about the world or you've come from a completely different culture in this case. And it's like, that's not really their fault. (laughs) Right. I remember in Galaxy Quest, the aliens like equate the TV show to lying. And I'm like, I don't think that's true. (laughs) I think the opening credits and the end credits sort of undercut the lying part of it in that they tell you this is a play where these people are performing as these characters. But it hits this weird note in Galaxy Quest where I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm not taking the alien side on this one. No one's lying. This isn't a trick. (laughs) Spoken like a true fucking liar. I'm really taking a, I don't know, I was going to say the conservative side, but just like evil villain side on all these, uh, I'm very anti, what was the thing we just watched that I was anti- X-Men? Oh, X-Men. I really want to put all the X-Men in prison. And if we could, oh, Kitty Oof. Pride over here going through walls. Magneto got to create... How much of my tax dollars are going to create plastic prison cells? Thank you very much. But that's neither here nor there because we already watched that movie and reviewed it. We're talking about Three Amigos. There's a bit in this that I found absolutely hilarious when I was a child that I, I am not sure is going to hold up. And that's the... There's a... A singing bush. They're like, how are a we going to know? Bush? They're like looking, like they're like following a map, trying to find something. And they're like, you know, follow the singing. And they're like, how will we know when we find the singing bush? And then they come across this literal bush that is going, <laughs> she'll be coming around the mountain when she comes. <laughs> and I found that so funny. And I would sing, she'll be coming around the mountain all the time. I'm sure much to the chagrin of my family. I imagine they would love that. People love at that age, song even without the context. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Even at age seven, I was made to leave home because that's an annoying song. <laughs> they sent you to boarding school because of that song. Wait, so wait, is there like a surrealism to this where there's singing bushes? There's a little bit, a little bit that I remember. I'm trying to think of the other, there's like an invisible man and they accidentally shoot him. Mm-hmm. But it's I think it's mostly that part of the story where they're like trying to find, I don't know if they're trying to find the town or what they're trying to find at that moment. But I, I don't remember a lot more of that other than their musical number. <laughs> Your face. Well, I'm looking forward to this. I love it when people tell me that um, this is going to be right up my alley. What are you, Ben Shapiro? Don't tell me what I like. <laughs> Is that what Ben Shapiro sounds like? That doesn't that sound like... No, absolutely not. Sorry. Don't tell me. I never me. actually heard his voice because, you know, I'm like, why would the fuck would I listen to this jackass? I don't recommend it. Mostly because there's absolutely no redeeming value to it whatsoever. This, however, is entertaining when more than one of us has seen the show that we're reviewing. <laughs> when 51% of us or more have seen the show. We're going to watch Three Amigos. Mm -hmm. Watch along with us. We'll be back after this. Hey, Jamin, you know how in the early film industry, the stars, the actors of the day, they would have multi-picture deals. They would have a deal with a studio. So like... The studio system, I'm very familiar, yes. Dusty Bottoms and Ned... Ned Niederlander, they would have Three great ex- they have a studio picture so far. deal. And then the third Podcasters example. don't have that. Right. They don't have that. Yeah. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Wait, who did I sign with? He said his name was Jack Warner? Hey, it's John Podcast. I was wearing knickerbockers at the time. Was that not was this the not? Name's a Jimmy Appleseed. I own Apple Music. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, yeah. It makes sense that they would name so it after you. We don't have that kind of studio support. We don't have the funding behind us. So what we need mm-hmm. is our yeah. listeners to help us. There's so many costs associated with this. I have mm-hmm. a steady stream Go of on. bubbly water. You need your Merlot, whatever shit you're drinking. It's Pinot Noir. I wouldn't be caught dead with What's the Merlot? stuff that tastes bad that everybody jokes about all the time? White Zinfandel? <laughs> no, but good burn. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Take that, White Zin, you These microphones. Poser. Damon's going through microphones once a month. He keeps eating them. It's a problem. Well, half of them turn out to be cake. I've been involved in a Netflix... Mikey uh, Day. Damn you, Mikey Day. Where none of them are gay. <laughs> none of them are cake, but they keep insisting I have to eat them to test. So if you want to support the show, patreon.com slash your inner is an idiot. You can support at different levels. We'll read your name in the credits. We'll, you get a special request bumped up to the top of the line, all that kind of stuff. So if you want to support it's us, like, like, pass at Disney like studios of old, like that great system oh, right. the that had no Better flaws. <laughs> no one was ever exploited under that system. No one was forced to do movies they didn't want to do. No one died penniless in the streets. Everything was fine. Patreon.com slash your job. Flawless. Wig, 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 wig. Wig? That's our theme song. Oh, gwig. Okay. Gwig, 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 gwig. Come on. It's like, I thought you were a musician. Hello, everyone. We're back. We watched Three Amigos, 1986's <laughs> Three Amigos. I think I got this recap. Oh, You've all seen Ga- Galaxy Quest. No, it's that, but in the West. <laughs> no, okay, so there's three stars. I mentioned it in the ad. We've got Lucky Day, Dusty Bottoms, and Ned Niederlander. They're stars of silent films, Three Amigos, but they get fired from their studio deal. But hmm. just after that happens, they get a telegram, a person from a small village in Mexico who thinks they're actually real heroes, sends word to get the Three Amigos. The three Amigos, thinking it's an acting gig, come down to face El Guapo, the bad man who's terrorizing their town. Turns out it's real, which they discover once Lucky Day is shot in the shoulder. Uh, And then they run away. But then, finding their spirit, finding their gumption, they decide, despite the fact that we can't actually do any of these things, we're going to pretend harder, and we're going to rally the town, and we're going (laughs) to defeat El Guapo, and they do. Yeah. And they kill his second-in-command. And El Guapo, and uh, yeah, I was like, don't focus on that. They also killed El Guapo. I don't know why I forgot about the main <laughs> villain time. <laughs> and uh, they save the day, and they refuse the money, just as uh, uh, they did in the in the pictures. True. And they ride off into the sunset, literally. Yeah, and, I mean, uh, you did a great job. I don't know you. why you can't follow the, your templates of recaps. I'm just really bad at them. No one wants to hear us recap the movie. Oh, you do. Okay. Have people said that? No, no one. No we'll drop it as soon it. as you tell us we can. <laughs> We've often dropped it just forgetting that we're supposed to recap these movies. More people involved, like the three titular amigos are mm-hmm. obvious draws, but I forgot about some of the other people involved. There's a brief cameo. This is directed by John Landis, for one thing. Brief John Lovitz and Phil Hartman cameo. Joe I, Montaigne. I appreciated that, yes. Yeah. Joe Montaigne plays the studio exec that fires them and playing... Exactly his gangster character in The Simpsons, that same exact voice. <laughs> yes. Uh huh. What I didn't realize, I don't think I ever realized this, is that not only did Randy Newman write the songs in this, he also <laughs> got co writing credit on the movie along with Lauren Michaels and Steve Martin. They like wrote the movie together. If an author had been with me while I was watching the film, he would have said, Damon exclaimed, Randy Newman? Question mark exclamation point. <laughs> <laughs> during the credits. I don't usually exclaim during credits, but in this case I did because of Randy Newman's inexplicable presence in the credits. Lauren yeah. Michaels, Steve Martin, and Randy Newman, singer-songwriter Randy Newman. I'm kind of surprised, actually, now that I know that he was involved in this and knowing his a little bit about his oeuvre, I'm kind of surprised that he didn't have more dalliances because this is the, his only screenwriting credit as far as I know. It's interesting also because there's not, I mean, you'd expect there to be like maybe more music. There's not not music. Three songs and then the rest of his score by, oh, what is his name? It's the same guy who did The Magnificent Seven. He's like parodying his own scores. Really? Um, that's why the, the score is, is actually great. What is his name? Elmer something. Elmer people Fudd. Who, people who know scores. 
uh, are going to be mad at me for not knowing it. You can do this. Hold on. I'm going to look at score here. Elmer Bernstein. Elmer Bernstein. Elmer Bernstein. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't approve that, so R.E.M. had to check it, change it to uh, Leonard Bernstein. That's pretty amazing. I didn't even catch that. Yeah. Isn't that cool? <laughs> it really is. I want to say one thing because you mentioned them already. Phil Hartman and John Lovitz, I appreciated their presence in this. Not because I do love them both, but they both have... I find myself very attracted in a non-sexual platonic way to comedians that have what I call Norm MacDonald syndrome, which means it sounds like you are a 1940s radio announcer trapped in a modern <laughs> person's body. Phil Hartman has that very, very announcer voice. Like when he was on SNL, they would give Don Pardo a break and just let him announce almost every skit that needed an announcer yeah. in it. John Lovitz also has that sort of quick talking way of talking. Don't say quick talking way of talking. That's it. <laughs> That's redundant. You're not getting anywhere with that. But he, you know, he just has that really snappy. Damon, not gifted. <laughs> I have a lot of stammering and some would say a faggotous voice <laughs> that would not have been popular in the 19 teens. Oh, He's led our boys to sodomy. And that's why we can't have him <laughs> announce our pictures. <laughs> I just love that in people. I think Chris Parnell has it a little bit where he just sounds like he should be announcing a trailer for a 1950s movie. Thrill at the scares. I do like Phil Hartman gets to use it the most in that scene. John Lovitz says barely talks, but Phil Hartman gets to say, <laughs> get wardrobe up here right away. Take away the amigo's clothes. I did love this <laughs> initial scene because it is very much – ridiculous it's set in 1916 it's like it feels 1916 like turned up a little bit everyone's wearing ridiculous clothes but not incorrect clothes i love when the wardrobe women came up and they were all wearing these sort of lavender smocks that you've mm -hmm. seen like if you've ever watched a documentary about early film production you've seen this before and they all come up they all look almost identical and just start ripping the clothes off uh, the three amigos to spite them as joe montagna requested I did appreciate it. It showed a lot of love for like that early movies. I also love the Three Amigos film we saw, silent film, where they're all sort of wearing caked on white makeup and their lips have been accentuated because that's what you had to do in the silent era, in the black they're, and white era. They're a little like, they all get like a freeze frame. And those were <laughs> my first laugh of the movie, I think, because actually the first thing they do is sing one of the songs and it was pretty funny actually i mean even before the story starts they just sing a three amigos song yeah. apropos of nothing just riding along singing uh, the three amigos song and it was, it was holding not a bad. note for 14 seconds according to the trivia of imdb i didn't go back and check that so take that with a grain of salt that song was it was pretty good actually you know it was like sets the scene and i feel like is indicative of the scene but oh yeah when they give the freeze frames in the movie especially martin shorts like awkward smile <laughs> yeah it's very yeah good. chevy chase is the idiot but also the flirty one is that correct they're all idiots yes sure. but i mean <laughs> right they are all idiots he's the most chevy idiot. chase is the most idiot yes i did appreciate he is being hit on by a woman when they are celebrating their faux victory over el guapo in the initial part and she says would you like to kiss me and he's, don't do accents. Uh, would you like to kiss me, she says. And he says, oh, yeah, sure. And then he keeps playing his guitar. And she says, well, he's like, oh, right now. And she's like, well, we could take a walk around town and you can kiss me on the veranda. And he said, oh, on the lips will be fine. <laughs> he's a moron. I find that comical that he's stupid. Just because I got to get into it and because you just said don't do accents, let's hit the Damon's Problematic Corner real quick because uh, we got some stuff to talk yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. We probably do. Come on. Come on into the corner. Ooh, watch out now, y'all. Damon's got a problem, baby. Ooh, watch out now, y'all. Let him know about it. Okay. So... You're probably not surprised to learn that there are some issues with the, you know, three white characters coming into a small Mexican village. And the white saviors? And I think this movie does get away with a lot because they're idiots. So you can kind of be like, they're mostly, I mean, they're not harmless because they actually cause harm, but they are, <laughs> they are kind of, you can laugh at them 
and not be like, well, you know, it was the time or whatever. It's not just that. It's also that they're idiots. Like, it's not just 1916. They're also morons. But they're. Right. And I think it's also, yeah. I mean, it's also making fun of movies that did this all the time. I don't think it's yeah. actively making fun of that aspect of those movies. Right. But it is sort of playing on tropes of, you know, earlier films where, you know, white people played. I'm assuming the three amigos are also of themselves supposed to be Mexican in their films. They're wealthy Spanish landowners, I believe, is what ah, the okay. Joe Montana character says at one point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wasn't really that torn because it just is so ludicrous. They are idiots, and I feel like it's sort of playing on these tropes. But I also didn't know how to feel about you know the portrayal of Mexicans in general in this yeah, film. At first, I was that first scene where they're still technically, I think, they're in New Mexico in that first scene when we first meet. Carmen. When we first see her, I think she's technically in New Mexico. Um, she had crossed the border and there's actually a good mix of like just people walking around in suits and, you know, people who are maybe in more traditional clothes. And I was like, oh, maybe this will be a little bit more nuanced. But then we go into like Mexico. And again, it's rural poverty stricken Mexico in 1916. So I'm not a historian. I don't know what that would look like at the time. So I didn't know how to feel. If What I'm getting at is I don't know what to do. Yeah. Just someone tell me what I should feel and I'll feel it. Well, and obviously like two white guys from the present is not the best, you know, like we don't have the best reflection of it. But the idea is sort and we of had the two art- white guys from the past come and we were going to have them uh, state their views. And in our pre-interview, we were like, oh, you can't, you can't you're, come on the show. You're much worse at this. terrible. You're terrible well, people. And technically, if you're listening to this, we are from the past. <laughs> so... There is that. Oh, that's – wow. That, you've opened my eyes. <laughs> but, Podcasting uh, is a form of time travel. <laughs> the issue is, as I understand it, would be, you know, you're cartoonishly portraying Mexicans. is either these kind of damsels in distress, either literally or like the town, or they're these like ruffians, you know. Literal un- banditos. You know, like raping, pillaging, uncouth you know, like savages, you know what I mean? Like, and they're we one or the other. We don't know that they're raping. For all we know, they just put women in rooms and leave them there. Do, yeah. With they, the that's threat true. of rape hanging over them. Capturing. The they're certainly capturing. <laughs> I don't know what pillaging actually entails, but it seems like they did some pillaging. They definitely did some property damage. Oh, yeah. With some Dynamite injuries. Sticks. Yeah. Thank you, Nobel, Howard Nobel or whatever his name is. <laughs> Howard, I assume. Yeah, I didn't know how to feel because I don't I'm not familiar enough with the history, but I thought at least we have two ends of the spectrum of, you know, this nice village of people and then these bandits. If it was only the bandits, I'd feel a lot worse, but I feel like because we have this village full of people with people whose names we get to know and whose <coughs> occupations we get to know, it helped a little bit to soften that blow. Yeah, and I think, you know, if this were made probably in another time or by a, um, someone who wanted to make a point about that, there would be some interesting things to explore to like portray some of those stereotypes and some of those uh, cliches and then play against them. And this movie mm-hmm. is not, it's not trying to do that. It's not interested in that. And it would have been a very hard sell in 1986 for mm-hmm. it to have done that, even if it wanted uh-huh. to. So I'm not, again, I don't think you can excuse it. Like Three white guys dressing up in mariachi suits is generally a bad idea, unless you're <laughs> specifically making fun of it, but, which they are, but they're not. You know what I mean? They're not I really mean, making I don't, fun of that. There is part of me that, I mean, I feel like that is part of the joke. Is that, that is part of the so joke. so yeah. obviously out of place and wearing yeah. ridiculous costumes. No, you're right. Yeah. Tyler came, he came in the middle of the movie and- Gross. I don't know why I phrased it that <laughs> <laughs> And I said, this isn't that kind of picture. I don't know what <laughs> what set you off, if it's the the southwestern countryside. Hey, just don't kink shame. It. Whatever he's into. Don't yuck his yum. <laughs> Either way, he asked why they were dressed so fancy. And I was like, I mean, they're supposed to, I mean, they're they're movie stars that are dressed in their costumes. Don't come into three amigos halfway through. You know, don't you're like a child wandering into the middle of a movie. You can't just you can't just do whatever you want. I can't unpack all three amigos while I'm in the midst of watching said amigos. While you're doing a walkthrough on your way to the kitchen. So he cleared his stuff. He's out of here. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> they also play into the sort of there's not really any play into they're all straight. There's not any play to that, but they are definitely portrayed as dandies. You know what I mean? Like they're, they're, and they were specifically playing on the trope of actors as these sort of prima donna, 
you know, they don't really know what they're doing. They're idiots. And they're like, they think they're very full of themselves in the beginning. They right. want paid. They're they want to be paid. In, in that. Right. When you realize they're Classic not being paid homos. at all, you're like arrogant idiots. They're portrayed as like, <laughs> we want money. And you assume that they're kind of like, you know, holding him under the, his feet under the fire to like get more money. But no, they want to be paid. They're just being paid <laughs> in clothing from movies and living together in a big house. Right. In the studio house. Are you asking me if this felt queer phobic? Is that what you're asking me? Sure. I wasn't exactly, oh. but I guess I'm. I mean, they, yeah, they are the portrayed as dandies, but I felt like that was part of their idiocy more than yeah. anything else. I don't know if I said this in the intro, but I feel like whenever Martin Short is on screen, my brain is always just like, that guy's queer though, right? <laughs> I think ever since like 2004, I've been waiting for the Martin Short coming out. I've just realized like, no, I think he just acts like that. He's just, he has, you know, he's just a gay heterosexual is what I'm saying. He just has a weird vibe about him. Don't say weird. Maybe I can say it. Um, I can't say it. I think ever since I was a kid, I was like, oh, but that guy's gay. But uh, he's not. <laughs> He's, uh, as far as I know, a heterosexual How about, man. Don't guess if people are gay or not. <laughs> I mean, that's half the fun, though. That's the whole reason I chose to be gay. So I could okay, let's get let's get out. We're floundering. Let's get out of the corner. Let's go. <laughs> Ooh, watch out now, y'all. Demons got a problem, baby. Ooh, watch out now, y'all. Let them know about it. This is us crawling out of the corner. I don't know why it's underground. Why I don't is it know. subterranean? I don't know. You can make a corner on the surface. You don't have to go deep down. Doesn't it seem deep down. like like a memory hole thing that Steve Martin wasn't actually on SNL? Like, no, as a kid, I assumed he was because I yeah. feel like he was on. He was on a lot of early episodes. SNL always wants to remind me he's like in the top tier of people who have hosted the most. But yeah, as a kid, I just assumed he was because you have the wild and crazy guys. You have King Tut, all those like early SNL skits that were really big. Just he just happened to be hosting. He had he's not associated with the cast. He did not have a contract with the national broadcasting company. Look it up. He didn't. No, I believe. <laughs> I know that's what I I said it in the first place. I wonder. Like Fucking- I want to know more. He seemed like obviously fine with being associated with it, and he. You know, got this movie was Lauren Michaels. He went to Lauren Michaels and was like, "Hey, I want I got this idea for the movie." And Lauren Michaels wrote it with him, along with mm-hmm. Randy Newman for some reason. And it's kind of weird because it's like very associated. And I wonder if he just was doing better as a stand up comedian. He was like, "No, I don't need to do that." But I'll I'll use the you know I like this whole thing. I'll use your do resources the... and various cast members. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, we've talked about our problematic Mexicans. Don't say problematic Mexicans. Um, Speaking of that, I want to use that quote, which is, he says when they go to the bar, excuse us, we're not Mexicans. We're from out of town. <laughs> like, wearing their big black and silver mariachi <laughs> costume. Right. So, I will start with my criticisms of this film. Okay. Which I, we is... Just did a whole- <laughs> I like that first third of the film where... I felt like I had a bead on what the film was going to be. But I feel like the tone starts varying wildly throughout the film. And I sort of lost track of... It felt like this movie kept going from a fish-out-of-water comedy to like a completely deranged, just screwball, throw anything at the wall, see what works comedy about halfway through. And then it pulled back in the last third to be like, no, 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 no. We can't go all the way back to a fish out of water comedy, but we can't go full on singing Bush anymore. So let's just stay in this middle range. And I don't know. I feel like this specific premise, which we talked about, has been done a lot. I feel like this premise works best for me, at least. When the villains are truly, genuinely threatening, but the heroes are ridiculous. And I feel like in the last half, El Guapo went from threatening in the first part to just as silly as everyone else. And I can see how this movie would be cherished. He says. Right. It's a sweater, a plethora of pinatas, those sorts of things. They're funny in and of themselves, but like 
it started to like defang the basic thrust of the movie on top of which the singing bush and the invisible swordsman that are smack dab in the middle are so far beyond the rest of the movie that it just seems like a deleted scene they forgot the singing to animals also don't forget that <laughs> oh right the see i was fine with that actually because it felt like it played into the old time movie trope whereas the singing bush and the invisible swordsman went into like the hero's journey of a medieval like yeah. saga. So I feel like that part was Blazing Saddles, like Mel Brooks, like kind of Farsi yeah. vibe. Yeah. Whereas there wasn't. Well, no, as it was in English. That. It wasn't in Farsi. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you know, it's a good joke when person pauses. No one just said nice. anything. <laughs> you know, it's good when your internet starts to slow down. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because that's generally, I don't know, to say that's not my favorite kind of comedy isn't, sometimes it really does tickle me when things are just very stupid. But it does, yeah, the tone was shifting a lot. Like it it stays in like a comedy silly realm. We get some adventure towards the end. They do like, you know, save the day and there is some, right. you know, adventure kind of thing. I don't thing, mind the adventure part. It was like the yeah. silliness of all the henchmen started to wear thin where everyone was just on this silly level. And I feel like the genuine menace that was felt at the beginning of the film was just like gone at that point. Mm. Yeah. I and that. I mean, I don't mind the Blazing Saddles like silliness, but I mean, pick a tone and stick with it. It felt like it was just sort of varying all over the place. It had that vibe of just like guys hanging out and just shooting the shit. And I don't know. For me, it was something wasn't coalescing. I can see how this would be a yeah. quotable movie, but it felt like I was not clicking with it all the time. Do you think it was when Martin Short busted out the Ed Grimley dance that it really just went I off did the rails? notice that. I was like, I've seen this dance before. I know this trick, young man. I don't get that. I think I just don't think that's that particular thing. I think Martin Short can be funny, and I, I appreciate him more now than I did <laughs> in the 80s. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's specifically funny. It's like sometimes when Chevy Chase does his physical comedy things, sometimes I think it's really funny. And then sometimes I'm like, this is going to go on for a minute. So I can go to the <laughs> Yeah, like the, I taco, didn't, um... the taco bit. He didn't know how to eat a taco and stuff kept falling out. And he was doing his like uh -huh. Chevy Chase thing that he does in like everything he's ever been in. And it's like the the tape in Christmas Vacation, you know, like or he like gets stuff stuck and... If you think that's funny, then I have no problem with it. Specifically, it doesn't tickle my funny bone. And so I'm just like, I know that I've got a good three minutes of this coming up. Right. It's it gets, not that it's the, the get jokey more. moments weren't funny. I just felt like as a whole, it wasn't becoming its own thing. Like, I don't know. I can see someone like quoting this, but if you actually like corner them, like, what is it? Does this movie work? I don't know if this movie necessarily works in the end i also thought about we talked about galaxy quest i also remembered mostly because um one of the stars is also in alfonso arrow who plays el guapo he's also in romancing the stone and i remembered oh romancing the stone also sort of falls into this trope of like a person sort of in that movie she's a romance novelist who gets pulled into a plot that very much resembles yeah one of her romance novels and in that movie, they sort of split the difference by having two sort of low tier enemies in Danny DeVito and I don't know the actor who plays his brother who are very like oh, no, silly but unmenacing. And then there's this Colombian like general who is almost too menacing. And I feel like that works as well because that threat feels very real while being able to still keep the fish out of water comedy going. Well, they almost had that with the, there were the Germans that were selling El Guapo guns and the German comes in and he's very There were the Germans selling the guns. I couldn't place why they were there or why they were necessary at all, but they certainly yeah. were present in the movie. Well, and the big payoff, I guess, is that the, the German who we know, who we've seen earlier in the movie is an incredible yeah. shot, has idolized Ned ever since he was a kid. And so he wants to draw and like have a high noon sh shootout with Ned and of course, Ned prevails i feel like that was an interesting moment because i felt like with a little bit more runway that could have landed for me like if they had already portrayed ned as like someone who actually learned sharpshooting 
Like we, there were a few scenes where we saw Steve Martin actually doing rope tricks, like yeah. lariat tricks, which was kind it's of cool Steve because Martin he had learned them. Does it. Right, yeah. <laughs> he learned them when he worked at Disneyland or Disney World, and I felt like they had given just some breadcrumbs to Martin Short being able to draw a gun, like do this high noon stuff. That would have landed better. They did it with the plane aspect, which felt a lot less <laughs> integral. But I felt like if they had led up to that a little bit more, it just felt like, hey, we're going to introduce this thing right now and also end it right now. We're going to introduce the fact that this German idolizes Ned and also end that thread immediately. I know, I know but it was charming to movie. see him succeed. Yeah, I know a lot of this movie was ended up on the cutting room floor. Because mm-hmm. apparently John Landis was too busy standing trial for the Twilight Zone accident. <laughs> I read um, that. And so horrific. He was very upset with like with the state of things, but it was too late at that point. But and I don't know if this is what ended up on the cutting room floor, but it feels like there are character things that were missing for yeah. the main amigos, especially. Especially Ned. Ned gets a little bit of an arc. And it's still there. It's just like mm-hmm. a dotted line instead of a <laughs> you know what I mean, a solid pen stroke. So it's like it seems like we needed, yeah, maybe just even a couple of scenes for that would have helped line it out. It's still, you know, I think it's effective enough, but it does. Right. No, I mean, I feel like a pedant just doing this because it's obviously a movie that doesn't take itself too seriously. So sure. I feel like, yeah. um, actually, I could have used a little bit more character development, but I could have done with a little bit more character development. <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. Like with the three amigos... I mean, they are all idiots, but I could have used just a scene or two of like what differentiates this idiot from this other idiot. Right. Like Steve yeah. Martin's the head idiot. Chevy Chase Mo, is the more quiet idiot. And then Martin Short is the little idiot <laughs> in stature. <laughs> and when we get the most out of Martin Short's character, because he or Ned has like, we hear him talking about growing up in <laughs> as a child actor. And we yeah. get one of my favorite bits, which I thought would really appeal to you because it's where he's sitting around and when they're celebrating the first when they think they've won over El Guapo and he's just sitting around with a bunch of like villagers who probably (laughs) don't understand most of what he's saying and he's just making the weirdest old Hollywood reference and he's like yeah you know Dorothy Gish Lillian's sister which I don't know if those are real people or not I hope they're not because they are they are real people Lillian Gish is the, the Gish sisters are real Okay. I don't know. And it's almost funnier if they weren't. But uh, I mean, it is a ridiculous last name, but they are (laughs) real people. I just like it because he's just. I enjoyed that as well. Name dropping. Yeah. Dorothy Gish told him he's got it. You're a star or whatever she's. And I'm like, oh, I want to contradict myself for a second because I welcome it. Another favorite moment, despite the fact that I was saying I don't, the Chevy Chase's physical comedy thing doesn't get me Mm -hmm. sometimes it does and one of the examples is when he's playing guitar and i'm gonna demonstrate maybe it's just because it's guitar based but he's sitting around with an acoustic guitar which is this is not but he's doing uh a rasqueado which is when you know the spanish style like fast drumming but he clearly can't do it and so he's just like it's very bad and (laughs) i does the movie portray it as bad or yes yeah it's clear because he's like like Making faces like he's concentrating and everybody's just kind of looking at him like, yeah. <laughs> I really need- it's fun uh, when Chevy Chase is portrayed as an idiot because he seems like a giant asshole in real life. <laughs> so it's Apparently fun to laugh was, at him. There was a little, uh, I, again, grain of salt because it came from one of the trivia things. I don't remember if it was IMDb where he was mad at John Lannis because he was this, some line would make him seem like too much of an idiot. And then John Landis was like, I'll just give it to Martin Short. And then he was like, well, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> Martin Short, who will relish at playing your idiot. He does seem like a giant jackass. Olympic level. While we're talking about funny highlights, the the one part that made me actually nearly have to stop the movie because I was laughing so much was when they find out it's real. And <laughs> luck, luck, Lucky gets shot in the shoulder, comes back, inspects their gun, yeah. realizes they're real bullets. He's like, I'm going to, you know, he's yeah, like, I'm gonna, like, like report you're in big trouble or whatever. Yeah. And then he comes back and, and just tells the guys it's real. And then they just all start crying. <laughs> <laughs> and the way they do it, they're like trying to be brave. That was good. That was a very good bit. 
I did laugh out loud even uh, during that that part. I also appreciated with El Guapo when his henchmen who had been roundly shooed off. I was going to say scared off, but they're just sort of mostly shooed off by the three amigos thinking they're doing a just a fight, a, a show, a show fight. They tell him they said they had called him sons of motherless goats. And El Guapo says, I shall find these three amigos, cut open their stomachs and squeeze the shit out of them, which I appreciated for its violence. Uh, And that's when I was like, oh, I like this because El Guapo is going to be actually menacing and terrifying. Yeah. But later he gets a sweater and he's hanging out with Germans and it's funny. And he has like a medieval dungeon uh, in his tiny town that he's taken over. I remember that bit. Yeah. When Seymour is chained up. And I just remember that from childhood. He's like got these counterweight chains and he can almost make it to the thing and then he doesn't. And I must have watched it a lot because I definitely remember that scene, but I'm also like, what is the joke here that he can almost make it? <laughs> he can almost make watching. it. And I kept wondering, why did they set this up? Why is it a mind game? Why don't they just chain him to the wall? Why would they set it up this way so that he can reach the front and loosen himself? Does seem like something they do in a Western though. So maybe it's from something. I did also, I know we were complaining about Chevy Chase and you were complaining specifically about his physical comedy. I did appreciate the moment where he's the only successful one they infiltrate El Guapo's hideout. He's the only one who actually reaches his mark, which is he gets into Carmen's room to rescue her. And she's like, there's a guard outside. You'll have to, you know, knock him out in order for us to get out. And so, you know, he grabs his gun and he's going to hit the man with the butt of his gun and he just can't bring himself to do it. He's like, He's about to hit him and he like keeps slowing down as he gets to the man's skull. And then Carmen does it for him. But I appreciated that because if I was rescuing someone, I wouldn't want to hit someone with the butt of a gun or shoot them. I mean, eventually they get over that and they're shooting people left, right, and center. But I did appreciate that because I don't know. what I mean, can you just hit someone with the butt of a gun and they get knocked out? That seems dangerous. No. It also seems like the gun might go off, you know, hitting That's someone a, with it. If, if you knock someone out for an extended period of time, that's a coma. That's a uh, yeah. That's, that's not good. Serious. That's a concussion. I mean, <laughs> if he's a terrible person, he's a terrible person, and I'm yeah. not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna stay up nights. But still, like that's <laughs> if someone's unconscious, that means their brain is swelling, and they they, you know, you got to drill a hole or something. My doctor was a doctor in the 1890s, so you got to drill a hole <laughs> to let the demons out. Give I don't know. Throw some leeches on him. There's a uh, also seen just another. I guess I'm. Shitting on my own premise because there's another Chevy Chase moment that is pretty funny, and that's when just say you love Chevy Chase and all his political beliefs. <laughs> just say is it. Does he have bad political beliefs too? I thought he was. I just mean, an I asshole. don't know what his politics are, but the things he's shouted at gay people, black people, not sure. good things. <laughs> yeah. And there's only one party who's really embraced that. Um, so there's. <laughs> And that's the Green Party, surprisingly enough. Jill Stein. They, Cornel uh, West is actually running with Chevy Chase for president. Isn't that weird? They do a bit earlier in the movie where they sing My Little Buttercup, which I didn't realize was also <laughs> written for the song by Randy Newman. <laughs> that's crazy. Um, and so in the original, in the bar, Chevy Chase is playing piano while the other two do the dance. So they do it again later in front of El Guapo to try to like, be like, hey, we're actors. This is—is is that mm-hmm. what it is, or are they trying to? I don't remember when it is, or maybe they're trying to distract him or something. And Chevy Chase is to distract him is just standing there, and he's still dressed up because he was trying to blend in earlier, <laughs> and so he doesn't. He's got the different clothes on because he doesn't have a part in this because he's usually playing the piano. He just like does this like. <laughs> Holds his hands up, like displaying, like showing their dance, like pointing to them, like, hey, isn't this great? And that was a pretty good bit. I also, if we're just talking bits, I will also reference the first My Little Buttercup bit, which is funny because it's preceded by this German arriving, shooting a bunch of fuckers in the bar in town and saying, you know, my friends are coming. You'll know them when you see them. And like basically scaring the hell out of all the patrons of the bar. And then these three ridiculous men come in, two of which are singing My Little Buttercup. And everyone in the bar is absolutely terrified of them because they think they're these insanely violent people. And it made me laugh as a 
Steve Martin and Martin Short are uh, keep pointing to them to help them like sing along with the song. And the guys are these really tough looking hombres, I think I can say, are genuinely scared and keep saying these cute lyrics in scared voices. And that, DJ, is comedy. Hmm. You don't think grown men saying things, saying <laughs> funny things in scared voices isn't comedy. I think that's interesting. You're the real Chevy Chase of this podcast. There's too many negatives in that sentence. I don't know how to answer that. It's a word game. Do you have any other big points? Because I do have more quotes, actually. But I only have quotes. I'm sure everyone's favorite part. This is uh, just a litany of quotes. I've got no more big things. You want to just do a quote off? Sure. Okay. Sure. You go. You start. Oh, I already said the one about the. Uh, oh, can I have your watch when you're dead? That little <laughs> cute boy asks Chevy Chase for his watch, knowing <laughs> that Chevy Chase, goes, Chevy Chase will saying? not be able to um, survive against El Guapo. One that I've actually used and didn't know it was from this or didn't remember is they're sneaking back into the studio to get their costumes to go do this job. <laughs> and lucky Steve Martin is on the wall trying to get their attention. And he keeps making bird noises louder and they are not getting it. They're not understanding it. Eventually he's just saying, look up here, look up here. And then eventually he just yells at him. But I do that sometimes. Look and they're here. only like four, he's only four feet above them. Yeah. Like when it finally, it's just been using like medium shots, cutting back and forth between them. And then it finally does a wide shot and you realize he's three feet above them, just yelling at them. This is what I texted you. This is mostly because of Steve Martin's delivery. So it's going to be great when I just retell it. But during the final scene, they pull a fast one on El Guapo. And El Guapo, I believe, I think, does he have Carmen hostage or something? He has someone at gunpoint and Steve Martin says, not so fast, El Guapo. Or I'll pump you so full of lead, you'll have to use your dick as a pencil. And El Guapo says, what do you mean? And Steve Martin says, I don't know. Uh, which makes me laugh. I like it when people are confident but don't know what they're saying. That, my dear TJ. <laughs> That's comedy. That's now, you comedy. said this other thing was comedy. So now they're I'm both, really confused. They both are 50% comedy and together they are 100% they're comedy. All, okay. There's a bit in the – when they're in the bar – and I can't remember what the other person says, but Lucky is pretending like he understands. And he just goes, mm, yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> it was another Steve Martin delivery thing that made it really good. He clearly doesn't know what's going on. I have nothing else except Sons of a Motherless Goat, which makes yeah. me laugh. Because this is the first time I had ever no heard sense. someone. I think this is, you know, I would have been four when this came out. So I hadn't been in plays yet. But this is the first time I ever heard someone say, line. when they. <laughs> He's like, when they're... <laughs> confronting Go Guapo's men, he doesn't remember his thing. He just says, line, <laughs> wherever also, there's Also, it's justice. like they're saying. It's what they say all yeah. the time. So the yeah. fact that he doesn't remember this line they constantly repeat is ludicrous. Ludicrous. That's pretty good. And then later he's like, yeah, but I, I missed that one line. They're like, no one noticed. <laughs> <laughs> they are very encouraging towards each other, which I appreciate. I don't know where someone has said this, but someone in my life has definitely said, not bad for a matinee. Which is what they say <laughs> after the first fight. <laughs> Pretty good. Let's see. What does he say? He Steve Martin goes on this extended rant of when he's threatening El Guapo and he says something about, let the land be distributed equally amongst the locals and there will be three branches of government. The executive. <laughs> <laughs> cool. um, that was a good one. That's funny because it's before we took Texas away from Mexico. You know, it is right funny. after. Hold on. I want to find this quote because this one actually made me laugh, but it was a longer quote and I didn't want to write it down. So if you could just bear with me for a minute. I'll do that. While you're looking that up, there's also a moment where their big plan at the end is to all dress up like the Amigos. And so the whole town is sewing and then Martin Short gets in the face of this very old one. So, <laughs> so very old one. This so like the wind. And then runs away. <laughs> I did laugh at that, and I liked it because her face does not change. He might as well not even be there. She yeah. does not react in any way, nor does she sew any faster, Yeah, which I assume is what sewing like the wind would mean. This was a speech. Again, it's one of the 50% of comedy because okay. it's a ridiculous quote said very confidently. This is when they finally flown back into the small town. 
and Lucky Day is giving an inspirational speech, and he says, in a way, all of us has an El Guapo to face. For some, shyness may be their El Guapo. For others, a lack of education may be their El Guapo. For us, El Guapo is a big, dangerous man who wants to kill us. But as sure as my name is Lucky Day, the people of Santa Poco can conquer their own personal El Guapo, who happens to be the actual El Guapo. (laughs) That's a good bit. I like that also because dollars to donuts, his name is not Lucky Day. Right. Yeah. (laughs) I think I think we've said enough. You want to go to the verdict? We can go. go. Yeah. Let's ride off. Oh yeah. We need a third, but you know, what are you gonna do? We could go to a bar and be like, me and my co-podcast host saw you from across the bar, and we just need you to ride into the sunset with us. He's going to think we're swingers. I know. That's the problem. That's why I can never pick up a third to just ride into the sunset with me. It always gets awkward, and I'm batting away their hands. Damon, what is your verdict? Your inner child is just barely an idiot, I think, I'm going to have to say. This is a very eminently quotable movie. And I could certainly see if someone wants to fight me about this, but I don't know. This, as I've already alluded to several times, what's a new metaphor? It's never gelled into a jello mold for me. This never quite coalesced into gravy skin for me. I don't like that. Never coagulated. Yeah, it never coagulated like a hemoglobin should. I wanted to like it more than I did. It's not terrible. It has moments, but I feel like it only has moments. So you're a child is an idiot. Damon, you ignorant son of a bitch. <laughs> no, I think you're a child is not an idiot, but I think mm. that if I hadn't come into this with such nostalgic feelings, I don't know if that would have pushed over the edge because it does. We talked about some of the problematic stuff, which I think just the fact that it's farcical and the fact that they're total idiots does soften that a bit. Soften. And now it's soften. I don't know why it's You pronou- that. Pr- pronounce the T in soften. It's, it's an Ohio you. thing. You wouldn't understand. Let's keep talking about that, though. Let's not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it does soften it a bit. And maybe that's just easy for me to say because it's not my culture they're making fun of. But it doesn't necessarily excuse it. But it doesn't be like, yeah, it's part of the joke. But it also it isn't. You know, so mm-hmm. – I could see both sides of that. It doesn't bother me that much. What more bothers me is the points you made and that it's the tone is kind of all over the place. And it could have used a little bit more background, which I think would have made some of those jokes land a little harder and could have let you have room to do some more character jokes as opposed to just kind of one-off stuff. Having said that, it's eminently quotable. And the fact that this movie actually made me nearly cry laughing with the the crying scene – that joke alone almost pushes it over the edge just because it was so well done. And so because you're like, these fucking morons, because <laughs> it takes them like, you know, halfway through two thirds of the way into the movie before they figure out what's going on. Uh-huh. I really enjoy. Also, I mean, not to uh, defend them, but also Carmen. Also, it took her a long time, even longer, yeah. one might say, to realize these men were fools. Yes. And what I, she does say, I like the not so bright one. And then her sister says, which one is that? <laughs> <laughs> I did appreciate that Martin Short apparently had a secret. Yeah. A secret love throughout this whole thing of this this hot woman we had never seen up until the end when she kisses, kisses him passionately. It reminded me of a joke in a 30 Rock where there are like, I think there are three separate stories. And at the end of the episode, Tracy references, oh, and then Jenna solved that thing with her dad. Oh, you weren't here. You weren't around for that because <laughs> we never see it. Do you have any nominees? I think my single scene, Sally Field Memorial single scene award goes to the turtle, obviously. <laughs> the tortoise. <laughs> oh, well, no, I would want to give it to uh, Phil Hartman. Okay. We can, and John we can do that. For their, their wacky voices. We can give it to Phil Hartman. He's what about it. I think it or Catherine O'Hara? Yeah, because we have a Catherine O'Hara Memorial MVP award. Oh, man. I will say, I mean, I've already criticized El Guapo for the tone stuff, but it also feels like the actor playing him is having the most fun of anyone. But it feels wrong for me to nominate him. 
I don't feel like it's MVP level, though. Well, well, who would you nominate? I mean... Who the fuck would you nominate? I'm trying to think of one of the three main boys. Like, I don't think it can be... You love Martin Short's gish comments. Yeah, I'm going to say Martin Short. Boom. He does save the day several times. What do you think, everybody? Email us, your inner child is an idiot at gmail.com. You can text us or leave us a voicemail, 615-576-0525. What? I was just thinking of not Martin Short in this, but Martin Short in Arrested Development when he says, launch me, and uh, someone launches him at Jason Bateman's testicles because it's funny. It's funny when someone, Martin Short plays old men really well. Yes. He plays young looking men because he's so young looking, but he also, in this magical way, because he's so small, can play old men really well. And he plays this Jack LaLanne type in Arrested Development. If you haven't seen it, I don't feel like I need to explain it. But he has a man who carries him around because his legs no longer work. And he commands him by just yelling out, Short declarative sentences, or yeah, declarative sentences. Launch me. And at one point, he wants nuts because there's a bowl of nuts, but the man misunderstands and he launches him towards Jason Bateman's testicles. And that is comedy. Now we're at 200%. <laughs> I want to think uh, Jackson has an unhealthy sub- obsession with Damon for the our Damon's problematic corner theme music. That's Thank all you. very hard to say professional broadcaster <laughs> and uh, i want to thank my friend ross weaver for the use of his song top of two for our ad music uh we want to thank our patrons for supporting the show including just cuz Lindsay halleck scalphosaurus the zesty the elusive van gromkin beth sermont damon's australian accent too accurate captain jean-luc picard his honor the mayor of santa Poco. shit what of Santa Poco. He's the Oh yeah. Santa Poco. I get it now. Shit on the cartouche. Zachary Hartley. Josh Frigo. Travis Vance. Lindsay Nell. Bill Haynes. Jackson has an unhealthy obsession with Damon. Early Larissa reference. Maestro. Particle Man. Heather Tuggle. Caroline Amberson. Jeremy Powlin. Karen Curd. Tommy Boy is Damon's favorite movie. The supreme ruler of this podcast. The McWilly House of Cats. Ah, mmm. Dr. Malcolm Stephen Bosom. David Mort. T. Smith. James Taylor. Dramatically plays the hot dog. <laughs> the Hands of Fate. And Jonathan Day. Thank you all very, very much for supporting the show. If you want to support like them, patreon.com slash your child's an idiot. And now, now for real. Oh, no. We ride off into the sunset. Oh, yeah, of course. Good night, Ned. I can stop now, right? Good night, Ned. Oh.